I think I am not the only person who is worried. The entire country is worried. Because what is the record? What was the record before this government came into power? And what has been the record? And when Ahmed got attacked, I kept on saying that Ahmed was dead. But my biggest worry was existing journalists. And I've been vindicated. Many journalists have been under serious and constant attack from people within this government. And here is seen as an unsafe place to practice journalism. And that is the manifestation. When you allow such sorts to fester, people get emboldened and they get the impression that the best they should have to do is to attack journalists. And as I speak, this same person who did this is vying for a presidential flag bearership of the same government. It's unfortunate, but I believe that no matter what it is, the truth will triumph. Welcome to Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers, and this is The Murder of Ahmed Devella, Part 2. The truth will triumph. Since the number 12 expose, an investigative piece that shook the very foundations of the Ghana Football Association, Ahmed has never been a coward. So as you can see, rolling on the screen. This is a boy! Or a bad boy! Ahmed worked closely with the award-winning investigative journalist Anas Aramiyao Anas. Together they exposed corruption in the Ghanaian judiciary, health sector, and most recently, soccer. But I must prefer the noisy, boisterous, sometimes scurrilous media of today. Many here may not know that they were neighbors to a member of one of the world's foremost team of investigative journalists. So what about those who say putting his face and his name and where he lives could be vital information for those who may want to hurt him? No, and no. so in other words, you are accomplice. It was necessary for me to bring the guy's picture out for people to see who he is. The truth will triumph. At the end of the last episode, we heard about Ahmed's murder. And one thing that really struck me from reading witness testimonies was the professionalism of the hit, for want of a better phrase. Because three shots had been fired at Ahmed, one in the neck, two in the chest. And as a Ghanaian journalist noted, obviously they were trained marksmen who shot with military precision. And I kept coming back to that phrase. This wasn't like one of those assassinations where the target is sprayed with loads of bullets in a chaotic burst of automatic weapon fire. Now this was methodical, targeted, precise. All these signs that you mentioned that were present in Develop's case, military precision, a scene like a Hollywood movie, they're all indicators and they reinforce the argument that this case was a hit, was a contract healing. It does suggest that the perpetrator had some ability to operate a firearm, had some degree of training, but then to pinpoint whether he was a member of the police or the military is difficult to affirm. This is Ana Paula Oliveira, an analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and manager of the Assassination Witness Project. Other features of this case also suggest that this killing was a contract killing because it was a drive-by shooting and no belongings were taken so we could re-rule out robbery and also suggest that there was no personal involvement between the the perpetrator and, and the victim. But again, to what level the professionalism of the perpetrator would help them, them to be identified is also difficult because it has been argued that as more professional the contract killer is, is more difficult would be for them to get caught. And it's very important to identify the hitman and the contract killer because they are the link with the mastermind. They are the ones who could bring evidence against the mastermind. In this case, in particular, the level of information related to the material actor, related to the investigation in general, is very low. So it's very difficult for us to analyze or say anything about this commission of this murder, which is a huge problem for this case and for getting accountability and for holding perpetrators accountable. Accountability is a really interesting word. 
The murder of Ahmed is a prominent case, but tragically it's not the only example of violence and harassment against Ghanaian journalists in recent years. And this is why we've seen Ghana slip over 30 places in the Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index since they hosted World Press Freedom Day in 2018. And you see, these attacks have been carried out mainly by state forces like the police or the military. CPJ recently published a report evaluating the press freedom situation in Ghana, uh, focusing in particular on impunity for crimes against journalists. This is Jonathan Rosen, a senior researcher with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Jonathan and the CPJ were in communication with Ahmed after the threats he received in the months leading up to his murder. Since Devela's death, which is now over four years ago, at least 30 other Ghanaian journalists and media workers have faced abuses in connection with their work. This includes attacks, threats, and arrests. Nearly half of those 30 journalists, so 14 of them, were physically attacked, and nine of those 14, which is roughly two-thirds, were attacked by members of Ghana's police or military. What this analysis tells us is that in the years since Ahmed's murder, journalists continued to face attacks, and that a significant proportion of those attacks came at the hands of state security forces, which of course have a mandate to keep the Ghanaian public safe. While there had been a few patchy attempts at accountability, for example, brief suspensions of officers involved in certain attacks, unfortunately we found a broad pattern of impunity and journalists describe the responses by authorities as fundamentally inadequate. Let me give you a couple of examples that the CPJ have uncovered. An investigative journalist at the Ghanaian Times called Malik Sulemana was beaten by police and left with bruised ribs and blood clots in his left eye. Police suspended officers. But since then, Sulemana has been unable to get any updates. Sulemana was one of 17 Ghanaian journalists that have been arrested since 2019. I'll highlight a particularly egregious case where in June 2019, two journalists with the modern Ghana news website were arrested by agents of Ghana's Ministry of National Security. The officers seized their phones and laptops, and one of those journalists, an editor named Emmanuel Ajafor Abugri, told us that he was tortured in custody. Emmanuel reported being slapped and shocked with a taser while he was being interrogated. Both journalists were released over the days that followed their arrest, and Emmanuel sued the National Security Coordinator, Inspector General of Police, and Attorney General over the incident. Three years later, in June 2022, those authorities settled that case, agreeing to publish an apology uh, to recover the journalists' confiscated devices and to compensate Emmanuel. But I mean, Emmanuel has yet to receive the money and those authorities have subsequently asked to discuss a proposed revision of the requirement for their apology. So that's a particularly egregious case, but uh, again, just one incident in many over the years. You can see a pattern emerge in this. It's almost the state is fighting itself. Violence is committed, journalists arrested, equipment taken, the subsequent outcry sees a semblance of a response, but further updates on the action against those in the state security sector comes to nothing. The walls come down. As my colleague Anna Paula put more succinctly, it's like states' responses are insufficient to provide full redress to the victims, creating a sense of impunity that enables repetition. So, as we've seen, those who investigate corruption can often face various forms of reprisals for their work, not just physical violence. This can range from unfair and wrongful dismissals to smear campaigns, threats, online and judicial harassment, surveillance, censorship and closure of media and civil society organisations. We also have reports of arbitrary arrests, unlawful detention, criminalization, physical attacks, and the gravest human rights violations, which are kidnappings and killings and disappearances. This is Lillian Moan, Senior Advisor on Corruption and Human Rights for West and Central Africa at Amnesty International. For example, you have some journalists and activists reporting death threats that could be over the phone, on TV, 
or on various online platforms. We also have cases of journalists and media professionals being physically assaulted. We also see that some media and civil society organizations seen as critical uh, by their governments, you know, facing enormous administrative and economic pressure. So you have some media organization, you know, that are ordered to close, while others essentially blacklisted and prevented from benefiting from advertising revenues, something that might eventually lead to their closure and even to self-censorship. The CPJ have been collecting data relating to this, and I'll share the article Jonathan wrote on this a few months ago. But looking into this and speaking to a number of different people, it's clear that the situation in Ghana is almost certainly worse than has been reported. It is those who reach out to institutions like ours to complain about the threats that, that we know. There are those who decide to keep it to themselves. There are those who decide to take their own precautions. And so definitely the threats recorded will be actually lower than what has actually happened. This is Mohib Saheed, the Programme Manager for Freedom of Expression at the Media Foundation for West Africa, the MFWA, which is a press freedom and media development organisation based in Accra but working across the West African sub-region. In 2019, for example, one of the leading investigative journalists in the country had to, we, the Media Foundation for West Africa had to facilitate asylum for him outside of the country because he had published some investigative stories for which he had come under very severe verbal attacks and threats. There was one who also had to hide internally, leave the town from which he was reported because uh, his investigations had led to the resignation of a minister of state who he busted, allegedly trying to influence a judge who was handling a case between two mining companies. And this brings us to the number one issue relating to the violence against journalists, human rights defenders, environmental defenders and so on. And that's impunity. The freedom to do something as there will be no repercussions or punishment. In the first place, because accountability institutions are weak and are deliberately weakened by governments in some of the developing countries. Clearly, such governments wouldn't have any interest in helping build a vibrant, probing, and inquisitive media. And so that explains the lack of political will in fighting impunity. Secondly, the state security agents and political party militants are among the most virulent attackers of journalists. And the government hardly takes any measures against these uh, kind of people. We, we would expect vigorous condemnation from government and justice for the victims when these things happen. Unfortunately, it is a free-for-all for the security agents and then the political party militants, particularly when they belong to the ruling government because the security agents, first of all, themselves are culprits and so they don't really find, get the incentive to go after political party militants, moreover, political party militants who are pro-government. And so in terms of the political will, I would say it's almost none. What Mahib says reminds me of a video I saw recently, and it was an interview by the American satirist and political commentator John Stewart with Hungarian MEP Kathleen Sheh. And in it, she said that 
it's much easier to destroy a democracy than to build it back. Here's Jonathan from the CPJ. Politicians talk about commitment, uh, but these words, of course, need to be backed up with actions. We're not seeing the action needed from authorities to inspire confidence that the political will exists. I remember a Ghanaian journalist speaking to me on the day after Ahmed's murder. Uh, he was devastated, of course, not just because a uh, young journalist had been killed, but also because his killing reinforced so brutally a sense of insecurity felt by journalists more broadly in Ghana. The freedom of the press is absolutely fundamental to a functioning and transparent democracy. As Thomas Jefferson once said, our liberty depends on the freedom of the press, and that cannot be limited without being lost. Ahmed was murdered, and the public manner of his murder, I think, is a statement in its own right. But extreme acts of violence such as this are not the first choice for those wishing to silence journalists, but often the last. Anna Paula can explain. Something that studying violence and organized crime we always try to, to understand is that violence is not the preferred method, right? So violence would be kind of like an ultimate resource. And in this case, they come to this extreme violence before, obviously, there are instances of death threats and other, other forms of attacks, but it's to guarantee silence, it's to guarantee impunity. And I think what it comes to light is that there is a certainty of impunity which gives perpetrators the boldness to order a contract killing. So they really believe that they won't be caught for their murder. So a key factor that explains this is the political influence exerted on investigation bodies, including the police, on prosecution authorities, in the judiciary. So the extent to which state institutions are strong enough, are prepared to protect perpetrators in, as opposed to, to expose them, especially in places where such institutions lack transparency, they are influenced by criminal interest, it's closely linked to whether they're going to go unpunished and closely linked also to how willing they would opt to go to commit violence. So political and criminal interests behind assassinations, I think, are the main obstacles to successful investigations that would prevent new cases to occur. And I think also that leads to the pervasive impact of impunity, because it's a perpetuation of a system of corruption and crime that goes beyond that assassination and enable other cases to occur again. And this really sends a, a bad sign to the community, to the journalistic community in this case, but to the society as a whole. Anas, Ahmed and Tigray hunt out corruption. They are the type of journalists who expose powerful corporations and individuals that sometimes have a connection to the political establishment. These are fundamental nodes when trying to understand why someone like Ahmed is killed. So let's spend a little bit of time looking at how politics and organised crime interact in Ghana, because that intersection between crime and politics is crucial to understanding this story. Yeah, so what we usually see is that um, we see the, the political makeup and then the constitution of Ghana, for instance, makes the president so powerful. And then um, that's a lot of appointments um, in state institutions. A lot of them right from the subnational government to national government to state institutions, quasi-state institutions, etc. This is Gideon Ofozu Pisa, an analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. So what happens is that when these appointees are there, the thinking is that because it is a political appointment, the president or whoever my appointing or authority can take me out of office the next day. So people go there with the mentality of trying to enrich themselves and then also to make themselves relevant to the appointing authority. So when they get into such positions, um, there is that tendency of the amassing wealth, cutting corners, massaging processes so that they enrich themselves or so that they can also bring some amount of money to the political party to show how useful they are in where they are. So we, 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 we see that abuse of public power for private gain and then for political party gain in there. According to the Global Organised Crime Index, Ghana has the third highest levels of criminality in West Africa, 
And there are a variety of different illicit economies that operate in the country. For example, drug trafficking, which we'll come to in a moment, arms trafficking, human trafficking. And we saw an example of that through the investigation by Tiger Eye, which exposed a Chinese human trafficking and sexual exploitation syndicate. Then there's the illicit trade in rosewood, highly prized timber in Asia. And we touched on the rosewood trade in an episode about Guinea-Bissau a couple of years ago. Of course, there is the illegal wildlife trade targeting animals like elephants and the grey parrot. And then we have illegal mining, specifically gold. Ghana is the largest producer of gold on the African continent. And then even some illegal oil transferring. Anyway, you get the picture. Obviously, we can't go into too much detail in this episode, but I want to focus specifically on the relationship between organised crime, illicit markets and politics. We see the nexus between um, illegal mining and then party financing, for instance. When governments do come into power, um, what we see is that their resource-rich lands are usually assigned or occupied by their party faithfuls, and then um, as a way of paying them back for their support, or yeah, for their support for the government in power. And then um, getting to elections, um, what happens is that key members of a political party are asked to contribute amounts of money to finance um, campaigns and then when you look at the background of what these people are involved in they are involved in uh, mining especially in gold mining some because of the political backing do mine in um, in forest reserves and then engage in all forms of illegal mining um, so we see the connection between that and then political party f- financing alongside illegal mining drugs are really interesting in ghana Accusations of drug trafficking and its relationship to politics have been used to attack political opponents. But some have expressed fears that dirty money from drug trafficking has seeped into politics. Back in 2017, Kofi Bentham Quonson, the man who established the Narcotic Control Board in Ghana, said that in Ghana, people who through drugs make money want to enter politics, before saying that he's not surprised that seized cocaine miraculously changes into other substances whilst in custody. I'll let Gideon take up the story. There have been instances in the past whereby, for instance, in 2011, um, cocaine was seized, and then um, we realised that um, when it was asked to be tended, we were told that it has uh, metamorphosed to cassava dough. How it happened, we do not know. Very surprising. It also happened in 2011 that um, confiscated cocaine also turned into sodium bicarbonate, that is, baking powder. More recently, in 2020, 100 grams of cocaine were seized on the Ghanaian-Togo border, only for the cocaine to mysteriously disappear a week later. The uneasy relationship between politics and drugs goes back a few years. For example, in 2014, the so-called cocaine scandal involved a drug trafficker from Ghana called... Nayeli Emetefe. She was arrested in the UK with 12.5 kilograms of cocaine. This arrest caused a furore back in Ghana because Emetefe had used the VVIP lounge, essentially the presidential airport lounge. The then opposition NPP accused the government of corruption, saying that she could only have gained access to this lounge through government contacts. This, of course, was denied. Last year, a former Ghanaian MP called Alexander Aben warned that in the next few years we will see drug barons taking over parliament. Indeed, in an interview in January with Net TV, Kennedy Agyapong said that a former MP, who has since passed away, accused him of being a drug dealer. Agyapong said it was because he wouldn't allow the other MP to take credit for his work. The point is, is that these accusations that get thrown around can be political in nature. They could be truthful. But that is why you need journalists to expose the truth for everyone to see. Here's Anna Paula from the GI again. So when people start reporting on wrongdoing, when they unveil high-level corruption, when they expose fraud, mismanagement of funds and other criminal behavior that could cause economic or power loss to certain individuals or group of individuals, that put people in a very risky position and raises red flags and suspicious if the murder was motivated by that expose. So especially in places where the rule of law is weak, where institutions that you would expect to function to investigate, to prosecute and adjudicate adjudicate crime do not operate as we wish they would, either because they are unwilling or unable to do so. So what I mean by 
or what the GI has been using as a definition of organized corruption fits very well into the situation here. It's recognition that organized crime and corruption are mutually reinforcing. And in these cases in which entities and individuals, they are not necessarily illegal, but obtain financial, political, social gains through acts of corruption. And even in some times to protect their business, they can turn into violent actors. Um, the treatment given to those people who expose this criminal activity and malfeasance is often retaliation, including surveillance, cyber attacks, strategic lawsuits against public participation, arbitrary arrests, death threats, and in extreme cases, murder. The Global Initiative has been monitoring assassinations and contract killings for some time. In fact, the latest version of the Global Assassination Monitor is out later this year. But one of the most important findings to come from this work is that there is a worrying trend, and that's the commercialization of violence. And organized crime has a significant stake in this growing market. In the GI's research on assassination, what we've been arguing is that there is this worrying and increasing trend of a market for violence and organized crime, meaning here more structured groups or even gangs can offer this service. So they will have the capacity to perpetrate violence, which sometimes include training and using in firearms, access to firearms themselves, which is commonly attributed as the most used uh, murder weapon in this case and other assets that would put them in an advantaged position to be ready to commit this target killing. So this ready pool of contract killings, what our director Mark Shaw calls in his research in South Africa of nursery of violence, have facilitated the commission of contract killings and increased the number of target killings in some places. What this market for violence suggests is that organized crime capacity for violence can go beyond the gang turf. So it can be used not only to protect the illicit supply chain or eliminate opposite criminal groups, but this market for violence could put in danger members of civil society as it's cheap and easy for someone to use organized crime instrumentally to, to get someone killed. Now, there is more to consider when you're talking about contract killings, and that's the person behind it, the so-called mastermind, who is so rarely brought to justice in any part of the world. Equally, the person who would benefit the most from the killing would rarely be the perpetrator as well. This is when they turn to organised crime or corrupt state security like police or military who provide that ready pool of contract killers. Organized, organized crime's involvement in a murder can be seen in the motive, in what Anna Paula described as organized crime corruption, or indirectly through supply of the actual assassin. So for people like Ahmed and Anas, you can see why threats are taken so seriously. Being an investigative journalist can be a really, really dangerous job. You are fighting a lot of vested interests. Here's Anas. We knew. We, all, we have always known that journalism is a hot profession and that once you decide to embrace it, you will come face to face with such realities. And Ahmed won't be the first, he won't be the last. There are many people who have gone. I can go today, I can go tomorrow. Um, you can also go. I mean, it doesn't matter how punchy your story is. Sometimes people have died of nothing. You know, so... We, 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 it's uncomfortable, but we knew what we bargained for. We knew that the work we did would not please everybody. But this isn't the attitude of everyone. Some people decide that self-preservation for themselves and their families is preferable. And you can't blame them for that at all. It makes total sense. But that's when self-censorship starts. Here's Mahib from the MFWA. We do worry about that because for effective accountability journalism media must be and must be confident there wouldn't be reprisals for critical reporting and so if we have for example the case of Ahmed Swale and after that cases of serious threats against journalists clearly a lot of journalists would practice self-censorship, particularly those who are also not, who are from 
media organizations that don't have the muscle to be able to provide them with the kind of support that they need. And so it's a particularly worrying situation that journalists have to let go of certain important subjects, including corruption issues because they fear reprisals after they have done the publications. This reminded me of a previous episode of Deep Dive where we looked at the record number of journalists being killed in Mexico. I'll put a link to that episode in the podcast notes. But I spoke to Marcela Tarati, the brilliant investigative journalist from Mexico, and she came up with a really interesting response to my question of self-censorship. She said that in Mexico they don't call it self-censorship, but censorship. Because Marcela said, if you have a gun pointing to your head, it's a censor. You are doing it to protect your life. It's not because you don't want to publish something. So I put this point to Mahib. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I think there is some truth in that because it is not something that journalists wish to do on their own. It is circumstances that force them to do that. And therefore, it is indeed an act of censorship and not really a willing decision by journalists not to broach certain topics. Perhaps if a journalist had some incentive not to pursue certain subjects because of certain interests, then perhaps we can call that self-censorship because they have willingly decided based on certain incentives or interest not to broach that topic. But if it is out of fear of reprisals, then I think I agree that the term self-censorship within that context is a misnomer. Back to Ahmed's case. Given its high-profile nature, why hasn't there been any progress in bringing those responsible to justice? Here's Anas again from Tiger Eye. It's a mystery and it's, it's unfortunate because what is the excuse of the police? Assuming that the police says that we cannot find the murderer, which we find a bit, it's not, we should be able to do something about it. What about the one who incited the people to go after? That is black and white evidence. The audio tapes are there. So I think that the, the decision of the law enforcement agencies to go cold on the matter is also brewing another level of anger in Ahmed's family and well wishes of Ahmed. And it's unfortunate, but look, people are being arrested for petty crimes of inciting violence on the internet and people are standing trial for those. So what is different in this for us? Anybody sitting somewhere would get the impression that there are political reasons why this will happen. And here's Mahib. Now, if indeed police investigations should lead to the doorsteps of this big wig in the ruling party, we are not sure that the investigations will be carried on to their logical conclusions. Now, we know that the bigwig that Mahib speaks about is Kennedy Agyapong. And I think it's important here to say that since he outed Ahmed live on television and his subsequent murder, we know that Agyapong has repeatedly denied any responsibility in that case. But nonetheless, his name is inextricably linked to Ahmed due to the language he chose to use. And the frustrating thing is that he hasn't learnt from that. In July 2021, Agyapong, again on a network owned by his family, talked about a reporter called Erastus Azari Donka and preceded his latest tirade with he should be beaten seriously and then stating that if he was the president, he would get people to beat him up. Now these are either careless throwaway words or they are almost Machiavellian in the pursuit of their desired effect. And speaking of the presidency of Ghana, 
Kennedy Agyapong is currently in the running to be the flag bearer of the ruling New Patriotic Party. He is going for the presidency. So it's now been over four years since Ahmed Hussein Swale Devela was murdered in front of a crowd and yet no progress has been made in bringing those responsible to justice. Monitoring by the CPJ has continued to show attacks against journalists increasing in Ghana, hence why the country has fallen so far since it hosted World Press Freedom Day in 2018. There is a quote from Ahmed's family representative read by Liliane from Amnesty International, which I think is important to hear in this context. All of us know that the world cannot move without journalists. And these journalists are the people that we're killing. When we finish killing them, who will now give us information? Who will bring that information to our doorstep? We will no longer have it after killing all the journalists. Yes, we know that Ahmed is gone and whatever we do will not bring him back. But what we are asking for is not to see this happen again to others. That is it. So should we be concerned about the future of press freedom in Ghana? Here's Anas from Tiger Eye. I think I am not the only person who is worried. The entire country is worried. Because what is the record? What was the record before this government came into power? And what has been the record? And when Ahmed got attacked, I kept on saying that Ahmed was dead. But my biggest worry was existing journalists. And I've been vindicated. Many journalists have been under serious and constant attack from people within this government. And here is seen as an unsafe place to practice journalism. And that is the manifestation. When you allow such source to fester, people get emboldened and they get the impression that the best they should have to do is to attack journalists. And as I speak, this same person who did this is vying for a presidential flag bearership of the same government. It's unfortunate, but I believe that no matter what it is, the truth will triumph. Finally, studying this case and speaking to people who have been close to it for a number of years does make you question whether this situation can be saved from the brink. It does feel hopeless at times. Here's Jonathan from the CPJ. It's not irredeemable, but there needs to be political will. Now that's the core. There needs to be commitment. It has to be a priority. In one notable way to show this would be to hold those members of the police and the military that are known to have abused journalists to account. Those are members of the security forces and they're, they're known. And again, they have the mandate to protect Ghanaian citizens. The authorities should identify them and hold them responsible. Knowing that there are journalists out there who are willing to put themselves in situations to expose corruption is heartening. Ahmed was one of them, and he paid the ultimate price in doing so. So what can be done to improve what has been a consistently worsening position over the last few years? Here's Mahib from the MFWA. We would recommend that governments openly condemn attacks on journalists by their security agents and ensure that the perpetrators of press freedom among their security agents are brought to book. In that respect, too, we would suggest the establishment of an independent body to receive and deal with complaints against their security agents. Governments should resource the independent National Media Commission, which is the body established to regulate media content and ensure professionalism. If the National Media Commission is well resourced and is able to do its work of bringing infractions, I mean, infractions of the journalism code, acts of unprofessionalism, bringing these to the attention of the media and taking this proactive step, it will stay the hands of outside 
interferences which always come in a hostile manner. For Lilian at Amnesty International, it's about time we valued the work of anti-corruption investigators. And, like Mahib, she believes that threats and attacks on these people has to be denounced. But also, that word again, impunity, has to be dealt with. We also need to end impunity by thoroughly, impartially, uh, independently, transparently and effectively investigating reports of attacks, killings, threats against you know, anti-corruption defenders in the state and bring to justice suspected perpetrators. And here I must say, not only those that carry out you know, the threats and the attacks, but also those that instigate them and those that promote such attacks or threats, including uh, state representatives and other non-state actors. So we must, in, in ending impunity, we must also target those actors and ensure access to justice and effective remedies for victims and their families. I think it's also important to remind states of their obligations to effectively respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the rights of everyone to freedom of expression, of association, including of those working to expose corruption and defend the rights of others. And of course, we must encourage states, we, we, we demand that state foster an enabling environment that allow human rights defenders, including anti-corruption human rights defenders, to work and to do their job you know, without any fear of reprisals. Democracy doesn't work without a free press. That's why we need to protect these rights, our rights, so fiercely. No one can terrorise a whole nation unless we are all his accomplices. That's it for part two of this episode of Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. A big thank you to Anas, Mahib, Lilian, Anna Paula, Gideon and Jonathan for being part of these episodes. You can find the links to all source material in the podcast notes, including a link to the Assassination Witness Project. This has been Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening.